There's no doubt which is the hottest place on the Silk Road. It's Turfan. It was in the middle of August, midsummer here, that the China-Japan joint expedition arrived at the place which was once called the Land of Fire. The Turfan Basin is near the beginning of the South Tianshan section of the Silk Road, which lies between the Tianshan Mountains and the Taklamakan Desert, right across the middle of the Western Lands. The hot air shimmers in the basin, which lies to the east of the Tianshan Mountains. Summer temperatures average over 40 degrees Celsius, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We were headed for Lake Aydin, which is near the lowest part of the basin. Next to the Dead Sea in the Middle East, Lake Aydin is the lowest place in the world. Our altimeter read 154 meters below sea level. But all there was to see was what looked like a vast expanse of flat sand. Apparently, the huge lake had completely dried up. But when we tied ropes around our waists and walked into the sand, hot, muddy water spurted up from under our feet. It was a lake after all. In fact, it's quite a dangerous spot. But no matter how much you exert yourself, you can never feel any sweat. As soon as it appears on your skin, it evaporates. It's extremely dry here, and the annual rainfall is only about an inch and a half. Turfan used to be an important junction between two sections of the Silk Road that passed south and north of the Tianshan Mountains. And today it's still important for the same reason. The population of Turfan is 170,000, and 70% 70 of these are Uyghurs. They're descended from nomads who once wandered the Mongolian steppes. In about the 9th or 10th century, the Uyghurs came to the oases of the Western lands and settled down as farmers. Most of the people here are Muslims. Thank <laughs> you. 
下，下面转转。啊，你下面，你下面转，发现。This is a cinema we found in the main street. Plays and films are about the only forms of entertainment available in Turfan. Going inside, we saw there was no roof. As it rains so seldom, there's no need for one. Even at night time, the temperature never falls below about 30 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So to escape the heat, the people sleep on the roof or in the garden under the moon. They've lived the same sort of open air life ever since they first left off being nomads. A range of reddish mountains lies about 10 kilometers or six miles to the east of the town. Travelers used to fear them, and because of the shimmering heat rising from the steep slopes, they've always been known as the Fire Mountains. When the mountains begin to shimmer, the ground temperature is already an incredible 80 degrees Celsius or 150 degrees Fahrenheit. No one ever tries to climb them. During the Tang Dynasty in the seventh century, a young Chinese priest called Xuan Zhang set out for India from the plain below these mountains. In those days, it was forbidden for Chinese to travel outside China. So Xuan Zhang came quietly from Chang'an, the capital, and six months later, he was here. In those days, it was called the land of Gao Chang, and it was ruled by a tribe called Han. Here, at what was once the capital of Gao Chang, we can see signs of the prosperity of the time 1300 years ago, when Xuan Zhang arrived after his exhausting journey from the capital. The town lay within a wall that was 1.5 kilometers square or a mile and almost 12 meters high or 40 feet. This is the biggest of all the ruins that are to be found today on the Silk Road. Before the birth of Christ, Turfan Oasis was used by early Chinese emperors as a base for their invasion of the Western lands. Later, when China was distracted by the civil wars of the 5th century AD, the land of Gaochang became an independent kingdom. 
It was a Buddhist country, far away from metropolitan China. And still today, within the ruins of the castle, you can see a stupa or primitive pagoda and the ruins of a temple with a staircase in it. But in those days, there were not only Buddhist temples here in Gaochang, but also temples of Zoroastrians, the Manichees, the Nestorian Christians, and so on. These religions had all come from the West and must have seemed very strange and exotic to the people. By the seventh century, when Xuanzang arrived, Gaochang was at the height of its prosperity. He was warmly welcomed by the king, in spite of the Chinese prejudice against travel, and stayed for a month. Every day, the people came to hear him preach the word of Buddha. Even though Xiu Enzang was only a young man of 27, he had no time for wondering at strange religions. His task was to bring back holy Buddhist sutras from India. And sometimes it must have seemed impossible that he could ever journey so far and still return home. Thirteen years after he had left Turfan for India, he passed through again on his way home. But the old land of Gaochang was no more. The great Chinese army had invaded because the Tang Emperor feared that this distant country would try to control and profit from the traffic on the Silk Road. The remains of Gao Chang have been excavated this century, and they include many objects that give us some idea of life in far off times. This figure of an official has a truly terrifying face. But this woman, a typical lady of her day, had a face like a beauty from Kyoto in Japan. Merchants from the western lands with prominent noses must have been common sights in the town. The Manichaean religion, which came originally from Persia, was based mainly on Zoroastrianism with Buddhist and Christian elements. It was rather popular in this area. There were also Nestorian Christian missionaries escaping from persecution in the West. Their faces are like those of Turks, but their clothes look more local. Nestorian Christianity was called Jingjiao in China, and during the Tang Dynasty, it even reached Chang'an, the capital.
The western part of the Turfan Basin was protected by Jiaohe Castle. Seen from an aeroplane, it looks like an ocean liner on land. It's a natural fortress carved out of the rock at the top of a cliff. It's 300 meters wide, or a thousand feet, and more than 1.5 kilometers long, or a mile. When the Chinese had defeated Gao Chang, they founded citadels to protect their borders from which they could administer the western lands. In Tang, China, a castle was more like a walled city. This castle had a court and a temple to the north inside, government offices in the middle, and the ordinary people's houses were in the southern part. According to the records of the Tang Dynasty, 7,000 people lived within the walls. The ruins of the many buildings that once lay within this castle show today as differently coloured strata. The castle was built by digging into the living rock. The people of those days carved their castle out of a mountain, just as they carved Buddhist images on the walls of caves. Today, you can still almost sense the presence of the ancient builders. This was the southern sector of the city where most of the people lived. We should call it downtown nowadays. The officials appointed by the Tang emperors were of course Chinese, but most of the other inhabitants were from different races. We know from surviving documents that people with Iranian and Turkish names lived here, and there must have been representatives of other races as well. Here, the people who lived more than a thousand years ago seem still to be alive. The places where they did their cooking can still be clearly seen. You can see what were wells too here and there. You hardly feel that they're more than a millennium old. If you listen carefully, you feel, you might almost hear the voices of the women who lived and drew their water here. This is a picture of a farmer's life that's been excavated in Turfan. Most of the landowners were Chinese, and the sharecroppers were either poorer Chinese or else they belonged to different tribes.
According to the records, sharecroppers had to pay taxes every year, whatever their crop was like. If they rented a vineyard, they paid in wine. If they cultivated mulberry trees, in silk. And if they were hired labourers, they paid in firewood or millet. This contract is beautifully written in Chinese characters. It was probably written by some official for a sharecropper. This is what it says. I will cultivate rice and barley on the land I have received. I will pay the tax after the harvest in the autumn. And if I can't pay, I will offer my wife and children as compensation. In those days, even a ten-year-old child was a useful worker. The sounds of common people suffering can be heard echoing here in this half underground space, which is said to be the remains of a prison. People who couldn't pay their taxes either had to run away or be thrown into this dungeon. A list of people who had tried to escape has been excavated here. When the Tang Dynasty collapsed at the beginning of the 10th century, several tribes fought over this region. Then, after about 50 years, the Uyghurs finally established an empire here. On the 24th of August, snow fell for the first time on the Tianqian Mountains. Time passes and the people change. But water from the melting of the snow on the Tianqian Mountains is always essential to the survival of the oasis folk. This canal took 15 years to build. In August, it's time to pick the grapes. Turfan is the principal grape growing area of the Western Lands. You can see many racial types among the women who pick the grapes. The grapes are dried by old men inside brick-built huts and that look as though they're made of mosaic. The grapes first came here from their original home in Egypt and Persia 
and they were already being grown in the time of Gao Chang. Even during the Tang Dynasty, wine and grapes from Turfan graced the tables of Chang'an, the Chinese capital. Today, the yearly production of grapes is more than 28,000 tons, and half of them are exported as raisins. Here, they'll dry for a month. You can often see people building a new house in one of the small alleys. During the summer season, the entire family, including children, helped to build themselves a new home. Every house in Turfan has a half basement where the temperature is several degrees cooler than outside. The ceiling is made of vines closed with a little earth. The half basement is used to keep food fresh and for the family to cool down. This traditional way of building a house is very convenient for an almost rainless place like this. <laughs> <laughs> At two o'clock in the afternoon, everybody takes a siesta, and the whole oasis is silent for a little while. But even in the middle of the day, we saw a few people on the dunes in the desert. Inside tiny tents, old people sit with their feet buried in the hot sand. The temperature of the sand is more than 80 degrees Celsius, or 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and they call it the hot sand treatment. They say it's very effective as a cure for rheumatism or arthritis. The Uyghurs consider the sand as a friend and these old men will sit with their feet in the sand until dusk. Halfway up a cliff of the fire mountains, 
are the Beziklik Thousand Buddha Caves, which are still half hidden. These caves flourished during the Tang Dynasty and later to the period of the Uyghur Empire. In the Uyghur language, Beziklik means a place that is beautifully decorated. But this has been a place of destruction twice in history. The first destruction was by Muslims when they invaded the Western lands at the beginning of the 11th century. And the second was by foreign explorers from many different countries at the beginning of the 20th century. On both occasions, the thousand Buddha caves were despoiled. The Uyghurs who came here from the Mongolian steppes in the 10th century were Buddhists at first. In Beseklik, we found pictures of them worshipping Buddhist images. But after the invasion of the Muslim Karakhans, they were converted to Islam. The Islamic religion totally rejects all images. Worse, a superstition arose that people would be cursed if they were looked at by a heathen image. They believed that to avoid the curse, you had to destroy the eyes of the image. So most of the Buddhist images in Bezeklik were defaced. Many of the paintings that escaped the Muslims fell victim to explorers in the early 20th century who took many of them away. They left marks on the walls that looked like peeled skin. But amid all this destruction, there still remains one fragment of a mural that tells the story of the arrival of many foreigners. It's a painting of foreign ambassadors. The faces of the envoys who came from the various countries of the western lands were carefully portrayed. The big eyes came from Burma. The one with a hat that looks like a helmet is the ambassador from Mongolia. And the man with a turban round his head is an Arab. And there can be no doubt that all these foreigners who came to Turfan from distant countries brought elements of their own cultures with them. Here and there in the desert, you can find a well. They form part of a structure called a karez that's very important to the people here.
Cares is the name for an underground water system that's been created by connecting a series of wells by tunnels to the foothills of the Tian Shan Mountains. It's believed that the idea was brought by Muslims from Persia, but when it arrived is not known. We saw people working on akares in the middle of the desert. They were a team responsible for keeping them clear of sand, which would otherwise block the channels. There were oxen pulling at ropes, which went through windlasses at the tops of the wells. Workers at the bottom of the well load waste sand and gravel into a basket, and the ox pulls the basket to the surface. When the basket is lowered again, the ox must go backward. When the Kares was first built many years ago, they used the same method which has been passed down from father to son. But we wanted to know how the water could flow beneath the arid desert. So we went down ourselves to take a look. First was the Chinese cameraman. Then it was the turn of the Japanese team. The wells are about 30 meters deep or 100 feet and their walls are plain earth. This Kares has about 300 wells, and every day, somewhere, this sort of work is continuing. We decided to walk along the underground waterway until we reached the point where it emerges. It was just wide enough for us to pass in single file. Inside the Kares, the temperature is only about 20 degrees Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but the water flowing underfoot is so cold that it feels almost painful. After the heat and dryness on the surface, it was a different world.
Ananda or Yaka. It must have been marvellous when people were travelling through the desert to come to a place where you could find ice-cold water. That's the way it was in the old days of the Silk Road. But why did they take so much trouble to build the waterways underground? Well, water flowing on the surface would either be absorbed by the sand or it would evaporate in the heat. In the days when surface canals were still very primitive, it was better to dig one underground. days gone by, if a man had enough money, he would build his own career system and charge people for using it. But today the system is operated by the People's Corporation. And even though surface canals have become much more efficient, many people use the good quality water from the Cares. After walking for about an hour, we finally came to the exit. The water from this Cares freshens a tree-lined street through the oasis. During the time we were in Turfan, the highest temperature was almost 48 degrees Celsius, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Even in September, the heat showed no sign of letting up. In the old days, people would wait until after sunset before setting out on a journey. Yuan Zhang must always have followed a road with a setting sun down it on his journey westwards to India. For the Chinese people, the West had a fascination of its own. It was the same whether they were merchants or Buddhist priests. They set out with hope in their hearts, hope that they could find something precious in a faraway country. Now we too were following the setting sun along the South Tian Shan Road. <laughs> 